2012 academic year. And there were 35 institutions involved, uh, mostly in the United States, a few outside of the country. A total of 300 individuals and 450 buildings. The goal of the program was to produce tools that could be used in the educational facilities. HPU is part of that. The students came from this course, which is run by Andrew Britton and Rob Borowski. It's a course that is focusing on service learning. The students are going to cast out into the wind and work with the nonprofits primarily of the outside community. I had them work with me. It's kind of an internal project. The project involves uh, surveying how comfortable people are in the buildings and so forth. So we did involve uh, more than 500 people and just acknowledge them there as well. Lots of surveys and so forth. This you probably may be familiar with in the concept and the process for continuous improvement. Once you've got your building and people are, are in it, then what you should do is just to see that they're happy. You can spend a lot of time and money possibly designing all the sustainable features and so forth. And hopefully, if they're working properly, one way to check is to survey the occupants. Or if you have existing buildings, you can do this as well. The buildings that we focused on are all older than most people in the room. I like this one. Let's go in here. You get your data, analyze it, see what is working, what isn't working, and then the hardest part is to make changes later on to go back and see if there's been any difference in the difference. Now, what is different about universals in this type of process? You can get surveys they're designed to measure how comfortable people are in buildings, in temperature, and <coughs> light, and sound, and so forth, and cleanliness. They're readily available off the internet through the USGBC or associated sites. Much like the V, they're designed for your typical new office building in the Midwest. <coughs> the students who were involved with the project, the first phase, uh, they went out and they downloaded or look at these surveys, so there's no way that we can get people to know these up. They're just too long, uh, too complicated, and they can talk about individual offices and so forth. So they came up with their own survey. This is one page out of it. It was done hard copy. It means you can just hand it out or speed it to the other people in the room and catch in the hallway and so forth. We have little happy faces and not so happy faces on there. Individual learners, very simple questions, and so forth. So this is the type of survey that you need to have students get involved with. They still meet all the lead criteria, but that's what you're supposed to do. So this is an overview of the timeline. The first phase was the first semester of fall. They came up with the survey. It had to be approved by our institutional review board. That was a requirement by federal law to do research involving different subjects. They required students to take some online training about ethical parameters and research involving humans and so forth, put in the final report. The second semester, the new students wanted to tweak the survey a bit, and then they actually collected the data. And that was done in April, so it's about a year ago. And the report, over the summer, I crunched the numbers and so forth, and then sent in the final report in September. With the research to practice program, there was uh, 35 institutions started out in phase one, nine went on to phase two, and then carrot. The prize and so forth was a scholarship to go to Greenbelt, a major conference in the Greenbelt field. That was awarded to two different universities. Okay. So we didn't we didn't win the prize, but we got lots of data and so forth. <coughs> the 
primary focus was on the Wailoa campus. And that's in Kanyoi on the windward side. There are two uh, major sets of buildings. We've got our academic center and then residence halls. 365 uh, surveys were done for the Wailoa campus. The academic center has about 1,400 people a day. The vast majority of those 1,400 people are students, and our surveys got about 20% of the building occupants. For the residence hall, 62 is just under 30% of <coughs> residents. There was a small number of surveys from downtown. Uh, the focus was on the Ottawa campus. Nonetheless, uh, we do have some data from downtown as well. What was the most common concern? It's too cold in the village. This is an actual drawing from one of the students. <laughs> Someone from the time <laughs> to draw a picture of himself freezing in a class. <laughs> this is well known uh, in the university. It has come up even in valid uh, Victoria's speech to this type of commencement and graduation. We survived the cold buildings on campus. Now we have quantitative data. This really impressed me. Far more comments about the temperature than things like cheaper parking or free parking. That was free parking. We want free parking. Far more people complain about the temperature in rooms than about parking. And then there were safety concerns. Those were only uh, from the downtown campus, not that we don't have issues on the wide on campus. But, and then, of course, uh, the you know, uh, 308 people took the time to write in comments, and then we've got more than 60 complaining about the temperature. So it is a significant real problem. The background. How comfortable we are depends on the function of the temperature and humidity and the air speed. Okay. So there's the kind of standard comfort zone, and most people are, are happy if they're from where the happy things is. 75 or so degrees, 50, 60 percent humidity. So that's kind of the goal where you want your building to operate in. And there's my office. <laughs> 64 degrees. It makes the record low. When I come in in the morning, and then it would warm up and get into the comfort zone officially in the middle of the day, and then cool back in. I don't have a thermostat that I can control in my office. Not happening. This was not unique to where I was located. There were certain classrooms in the academic center, and it's well known. Those are the freezer rooms, under floors and others, and some were too warm. The university changed the air conditioning system entirely, ripped out all the old equipment, put in a whole new system, except for the ductwork inside. So as they were doing that, we had a period where we didn't have any air conditioning. It got very warm. I was happy. This temperature community in my office during the renovations warmed up. I didn't mind. We did get uh, temperatures as high as 83, 84 degrees inside of certain classrooms, lots of fans and so forth. And this is after an improvement. Yes. I like it warmer than most people. We did get most of the time up into the official comfort zone, so I would give it a So that's, that's enough about the key. This is a look at data for classrooms in the academic center. This was done after the renovations. So the new system came online in late January and February. And the data was collected in April. If you have a well-functional system, etc., you expect kind of an 
normal bell curve. You're always going to have people that are not happy around 5%. We still have people that are not happy more than you would expect. Some of that, I think, is residual venting about the previous situation. But nonetheless, still a bit on the cool side for a specific number of people. Same campus, different building. Natural ventilation, no air conditioning in these dormitories. Same time frame. We don't have that negative stock exhibition. So it's not the weather, it's the building. Conclusion I make from that. The other major findings, we did look at acoustics and cleanliness, workspace, so forth. The noise, the only <coughs> place where you had a significant problem was noise and that's in the noise. That's not the building's issue, that's the occupants. Otherwise, the only thing people were unhappy about Regardless of what building it was, if there was air conditioning, that was too I think this is a good example, something that faculty and students can do this type of work. They can gather the data and the comments and so forth. It can be used in university planning and in operations. The, a lot of what we found wasn't uh, new to the administration. And that is provide a quantitative basis for it. For the office that I was in, I've since moved to offices and so forth. A lot of the issues come from the fact that the building built in the 70s. It was originally supposed to be a library. It's now sort of the modern improvement of the one year schoolhouse that has offices and labs and classrooms and a library on the third floor. The ductwork uh, has not been realized. The floor space has been changed tremendously. Even the decade that it's been in there, has been changes to it. But the ductwork has been there. They put in a new air conditioning system, a central system. They left the original 16 zones in there. So we still have issues where the classroom will be in the same zone, the same volume of space being cooled connected to an office, and so forth. It works better with more thermostats and other improvements, but still, to get it to work properly, we have to finally decide what we're going to do in the building, uh, our campus planning, and then once the floor plans are finalized, then get a million dollars or so in the new That is my story. We're going to change our intended order just briefly, change a little here, because uh, we think it'll work out uh, a little bit better. I'm going to uh, present next, and then I will have uh, Ray bring uh, after myself, if that's all right. Let's move at the end, and then we'll have Johnson conclude. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll do a combined presentation, which is kind of use uh, and so that'll be fantastic. Um, Lights. A little pun intended there, I hope you caught it. Um, <laughs> how funny can you get about lighting? Uh, sorry, hi. My name is Craig Christensen. Um, I'm a project manager, construction project manager at BYU Hawaii. Um, kind of a lighting geek. They asked me to be the lighting guru for BYU Hawaii about eight years ago when I came on. And I said, I don't know what that means, but I'll find out. And so I've been to several trainings. Uh, around the country. Um, has anybody heard of uh, NELA, National Electrical Lighting Association? 
Uh, that's in Cleveland, Ohio, put on by GE, the Lightning Training Center. Um, we'll go back to Boston at the end of this month for um, Sylvania training at Light Point, it's another training center. Um, also, we've been down to uh, Acuity Brands Lighting uh, Training Center in uh, Georgia, right just uh, near Atlanta. Um, these vendors will work with you and bring you to places like that and train you to you get yourself there. It's fantastic. I try to take advantage of that and learn a lot through that process, so I'm going to mention that. Um, Anyway, we're going to look at a case study of the David O'Malley Gymnasium. Um, finally called on our campus the old gym. It was our original gymnasium, building 57, uh, when we were a uh, two-year college, uh, so Church College of Hawaii, CCH, uh, before we became BYU Hawaii as a four-year institution. Um, these are the original, uh, some of the original plans. Uh, <coughs> back in 57. Um, high bay, what does that mean? High bay versus low bay. This is a low bay ceiling. It's a technical term in lighting. It just means 20 feet or less is low bay, above 20 feet generally, high bay application. It requires more power to push light down to spread it out from a high bay application. You have gymnasiums and they've got uh, a lot of power to drive that, that light down to the space. Um, and, and so there's a little different approach to lighting. Uh, not a lot, but a little different. Um, don't go into all of the details, but uh, yeah, there are different kinds of diffusers and, and things like that that help you to accomplish uh, moving that light down. Um, now, here's something interesting. So you leave everything you read on the internet. This is, uh, I got all this off the internet, and I agree with a, a good part of it. Um, I'm gonna read the, the end. Whether or you're using low bay lights or high bay lights, metal A light type lighting overwhelming, I think should have meant overwhelmingly, allows, maybe not, uh, users to, to illuminate large areas with very few lights, making, um, making it an energy savings choice for buildings of all sizes. So one, one fit all kind of prescription, and, and uh, I don't agree with that at all. So that's why I'm challenging this. That's why. I challenged it to begin with uh, when I took on this project. Uh, we started programming this project um, three years ago. At BYU Hawaii, we plan budgets a year in advance. Um, so that can present challenges, but we have a good security blanket that if we plan it in advance, got it approved, the money's going to be there and we're going to do the project. So that's really cool. I really enjoy that part of our funding approach. Um, <clears throat> so here's the before shot. Uh, the, the after before shot, I'll explain that in a second. Um, we had metal halide, 400 watt lights. See those big things hanging up there like bells. Um, I think with the driver, the, the ballast system that's in the, taking in the box right above it, uh, they actually push over 400 watts. Uh, the input power to them is like 440, 450 watts in there. Um, they are. They have all of these things that I listed here as negatives, in, in, in my opinion. <coughs> and and they're, they're good applications. We have a whole bunch of these in our other gym, and I like them. Uh, but uh, we have to have a certain amount of light for filming uh, basketball games and volleyball games and whatnot. Um, so the new gymnasium uh, has a different approach, and uh, that is the Pan Activity Center, about 4,500 um, seating there. This has some bleachers on one side, and it, and it used to be the original gym, and now it has become a practice gym for the teams, as well as uh, intramurals kind of gym for student uh, involvement. So uh, a lot of games played in there. It's also uh, first day, or, uh, excuse me, a, a um, evacuation location for the Red Cross, <coughs> uh, as well as the other gym that I was speaking about. Um, so there's uh, six basketball uh, standards up here, one main court, two crossing courts. They would go up and down and have to use kind of area. Uh, a little bit of uh, lighting on the sides from the, from the uh, windows, which is fantastic. Anyway, uh, I was going to replace all those lights. And, uh, then I started looking at it and talking to some vendors and, and remembering the training I had and started thinking, 
Um, I better think about this because of all these things that I, uh, I'll, I'll discuss a little bit about each of these uh, attributes, this type of lighting. Uh, there are some negatives, and, and uh, so I'll go into that just a little bit. Also, I got into the project and I looked at the ceiling. I don't know if you can tell on here, there's, uh, uh, I've got some better pictures of the coloring of the ceiling. It was the original um, ceiling. Uh, it's got this aluminum that is oxidizing. Um, had insulation above it that uh, had been worn out. I didn't think you could wear out insulation, but it was only about that thick. Uh, anyway, 18 inch space between the ceiling and the roof and it's a hot area where we're air conditioning that space more or less. <clears throat> so I figured we really have to make the right call. I bit the bullet and I said, you know what, I don't want to do this project this year after all that preparation for it, uh, which, which uh, it had been handed off to me. I didn't, I wasn't on the initial prep for this project on the funding side, but I said, we want to do this project. And I got to looking at it and I said, no, you know what? It doesn't make any sense for me to hang new lights in there. I was thinking about hanging some 2x4 uh, fixtures uh, on some cave, aircraft cables. I don't know if you've seen applications like that. I thought, I don't know, balls might get that. I, mean, I had my, mis my misgivings. And, and uh, I said, you know what, it doesn't make any sense. And then next year, we're going to try to replace the ceiling. And I've got to protect those lights that I just put in and not worry about up everything. So I said, let's wait till next year. We'll get the, the ceiling funded as well. Everybody went along with that, fortunately. So I was in that. I pulled out a, an old uh, picture of the original gym. And you can see it had these eight foot lights here, four lamps in each one, T12s. Um, that's inch and a half diameter. And if, if you ever hear, you know, a lighting specialist or anything, T anything, it's, it's that number over eight, if you think of uh, eighths of an inch. So T12 is 12 eighths, one and a half inch diameter. Uh, T8s are one inch diameter. T5s are five eighths inch diameter. Um, anyway, 480 watts is, uh, per fixture at least is what it started out with. So we had much better lighting later with around 400 watts, thereabouts. Uh, better lighting probably. <coughs> um, anyway, got the CCH on the shirt. Pretty cool little picture there. Um, so, let's talk about light depreciation. This type of lighting um, has, a, has a curve of depreciation that after a while uh, it starts to lose its ability to light and also that affects the color rendering index. So if you are to look uh, in this, uh, unless I turn off the lights, you wouldn't see it too well. Um, there are some color bands down there painted on the bottom of the gymnasium wall. <coughs> and there's a difference in the color under the different lights of the same paint. And that's that coloring, color rendering being affected by, uh, I gotta put this on. Um, it's almost a green light on the right, <clears throat> and the one on the left looks kind of almost rosy. And, uh, and then, uh, you can see it on this. Can you see the green in this? Yeah, no, no, no. All right, so, I'm not crazy. Um, so here's your lamp lumen. Uh, the output is measured in lumens. Um, this has a pointer on it. Uh, anyway, your T5 is your top kind of uh, dark blue line. Um, they keep the light output pretty constant over the hours. I think our, our uh, T5 lamps are rated around 20,000 hours for the long life uh, lamps. I don't have to get a genie lift to replace them very often. I have um, Four lamps in a fixture, so if one or two goes out, it's even fine if I don't replace them for a little while. And these other ones, if one goes out, there's a big hole in the ceiling. You know, something happens, so you can tell that there's not light on the floor and on the ceiling. Um, your metal halide is the red dash line down below. After 10,000 hours, you're down to roughly 70-ish percent of the, of the amount of light output. So I'm saving 30 percent power, right? No. <laughs> You're still paying the whole percent of, uh, of your, your power. Uh, all your water is going out there, but it's only putting out a lot of this stuff. So um, it's one of the issues. Um, sorry. Again, scalloped. You can see these light columns come down, and they're kind of the same distribution of the of the uh, covering, the, the aluminum covering. 
you see the scalloped effect on the walls. So this is great. You paint them white to reflect light, and you're not even hitting the walls until further down. Some of the light shoots up. You're losing a lot of uh, a lot of uh, light there. Your fixture your fixture efficiency rating is <coughs> pretty low. Um, I got one light off there. Uh, you can kind of see the the uh, insulation that had shrunk back. The gaps on each side, so really there's no insulation in the ceiling. The lights off. You turn it off on purpose, and it takes eight minutes to come back on. And uh, one of our uh, faculty members was concerned. He said, "Hey, turn off the lights to save power." Nobody would turn them off, even when there was no class in there, because they don't want to wait for them to come back on. And it's just easier than just get in the habit of leaving them on the whole time. So you're burning those those heat sinks, those suns up there in the gymnasium all the time. So uh, I also wanted to align with the lighting system some kind of better controls than on-off switches. These are the original. Uh, um, so sorry, that's an embarrassing slide. Fringe that I look at. So we we tore, start tearing that stuff out. Um, we we pulled out the metal beeline fixtures. Um, Check the floor a little bit, and we were working with our vendors to come up with a good solution. We were able to reduce my fixtures. You can, you can see in the center of the of the ceiling there are these uh, conduit posts hanging down here. There's there's five bays and there's seven uh, fixture um, rows if you want to call them that. We eliminated the middle one by instead of hanging these straight down parallel to the floor by angling them with the ceilings. We've got some crossing uh, light patterns there. Um, so we started recycling the fixtures, taking the aluminum recycle. We got them all stacked up there, parting and piecing them out. Our electricians didn't charge us anything extra to take all apart. Like, I got a labor on the side to be doing that while we're doing this. You know, um, started, they also dem demoed the ceiling for us. These are the aluminum panels coming down and the installation. Skip through this quickly so you don't see the ocean violation. Um, started stacking the ceiling uh, uh, panels on a plywood. We ended up having four or five of those stacks. Uh, so that's our, our party money for facilities management now. All this recycling, it was great. So we're not throwing it away, we're getting some money out of it. Uh, we reused the perimeter angle for each bay. We got rid of these uh, these crossing um, kind of runners, and they were, they were in pretty bad shape. But the angle on the sides uh, was in good shape. We just repainted this when we were here all the way around. <coughs> Installed the uh, heavy duty ceiling grid. Um, just like this stuff in here, but a heavier duty. Um, so, in a 2x4 configuration, which lends itself to the 2x4. Lighting fixtures. Um, these are T5 high output lamp fixtures. Um, four of them, like I mentioned, they're set up as uh, inboard and outboard. So there's two ballasts or drivers inside of this, or motors if you want to think of them that way. Run the two lamps here, and each uh, each ballast runs two lamps inboard and outboard. Like that. So you can dim the lights by half by changing the circuitry. Um, in the installation here, in, uh, 254 watts. So we've got 216 watts down from 416, less than half at least, um, in the, the wattage. Uh, two valves for extra control, like I mentioned. <coughs> Put seismic clamps on the fixtures. These are a little uh, right angle bracket that holds the fixture to the grid. Um, should there be any kind of shaking, these pictures don't fall on the ceiling at that height and kill anyone. Um, so the grid doesn't come down, it's, it's tied up to the girders. Uh, the ceiling. Uh, insulation that went in over the ceiling tile. Um, <coughs> the ceilings. So it holds them down so the ball goes up and hits the ceiling, and it's all safe and sound. Um, so I'm going to try to skip through this to 
everyone else a little bit more tight. Come out with a nice, uh, even, flat ceiling, uh, nice plane. Uh, when it lights up, actually the ceiling is a lot whiter than, than this shows. That this shows a lot of contrast, but the ceiling looks all white, you know, similar to, to this one. Blends in well with the lights. Uh, we've got a blue box system that times the lights on and off in the mornings when the custodial comes in and brings them up to half bright. Uh, in the evening, after whatever time they specify they're going to be out of there, shuts it down. And then in the meantime, we've got controls here. In a close up of our control dial, it's on power saver. Um, so I've got each one of these uh, basketball areas in a zone with a um, passive infrared sensor. <coughs> Um, so that allows them to turn off uh, when they're not in use, set with a timer, of course. Um, save us a lot more power than half of the power consumption when we add that into the equation. It's just a rebate, all kinds of great stuff along with that. Um, so we really feel like it made a difference in the look of the place overall. I mean, uh, when we are done, the only negative thing I can think of was we had to repaint all the piping uh, of the back basketball standards uh, because it looked all dingy and yucky because everything else was shiny and white. So that's a that's a good trade-off. So it looked like a brand new interior after that. We were pretty happy with it. Um, we can run different settings for dances and, and different events. Uh, these are actually uh, I was mentioning the vendor and of course the vendor gives us a light distribution. All these little little things here are if you look at the drawing a little closer, are the amount of foot candles. So it gives a light distribution. It's a photometry reading on everything. It's a photometric uh, survey measure. Um, of course, these are the lights. And then these I made in my PDF to track for myself the zones and the sensors that are controlled by. These are the basketball hoops. I got the, I got the each zone, each circuit uh, numbered so that when I go to program it on the, on the panel. I know what I'm programming. Uh, some of these zones overlap, some of these are independent. Some of these zones I have, of course, two circuits in each zone because I have half the lights. Uh, so I can really do a whole bunch of different stuff with those. So it gives me flexibility and space to, to light it how I want. Uh, save a lot of power. A lot of breath and a lot of time. Um, so that's what we did. I hope we made we, we made the best moves that we knew. Um, came out with a good product, I think. We're satisfied with the space. It's more useful, more flexible space now because we have better controls. Um, happy, happy. So, thank you for your time and attention. And I will turn the time over to you. Essentially, you know, our mission is to get out there and ensure that Hawaii reaches its clean energy and now sustainability goals. I've often said since we started that clean energy really should be a major part of sustainability, but we haven't been using that word that much, uh, but we will uh, going forward. Uh, and, and we, of course, want to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels. So that's, that's what Hawaii energy is. But, uh, the big message today, okay, uh, that was supposed to come out a little bit better, I'm not sure why I didn't, but uh, 
talk about a megawatt uh, and, and uh, a megawatt versus the kilowatt. All right, a kilowatt hour is a terrible thing to waste, and the reason it's a terrible thing to waste is it costs here at 101 about 34 cents. So if you're wasting a kilowatt hour, you're wasting uh, it's costing you 34 cents, and you know three of these wasted and blah blah blah. And the problem is we waste a lot. We just don't know it. And, and one of the messages that we try to get out is uh, is to make people more aware of uh, how they can find out where they, they may be wasting uh, uh, kilowatts. And and you know the, the the real good part about what we do is that a megawatt, that is the, the non-use of a kilowatt, a megawatt hour costs depending on how you do it, you do it in conservation, it costs nothing. It's just the knowledge of conserving that. For instance, uh, the point I made uh, at, at the lunch uh, talk, uh, turning the lights off when you leave the room. It doesn't cost anything, and yet it saves you 34 cents for every kilowatt hour that you don't use. And the, uh, the program that we have sort of rates itself in terms of how much it costs for us, if we're actually giving you a rebate to do something with a gadget, a, a more efficient something or other. And we've got that down to about 1.5 cents. So we can we can actually save a 34 cent kilowatt hour by giving rebates uh, and, and encouragement to, to the people out there to uh, reduce uh, their power consumption through efficiency as well as conservation. And it only costs us about one and a half cents for every kilowatt hour. That's a real bargain. That's a big bargain, much bigger than uh, you know, the bargain. It is a great bargain to put EV on the roof and, and get uh, free sunlight. But that costs you. It costs you a lot more than 1.5 cents a kilowatt hour, but it's less than 34 cents a kilowatt hour. So, uh, you just need to think this thing through, and before you do anything to pay for you're putting PV on your roof, you need to cut your, uh, or you get you get the megawatts going in your life, and, and so that's the, that's the big message. All right, there are some easy hits and some cheap hits, and I think Kurt talked about lighting. Uh, if you still have incandescent bulbs in any place that you are responsible for, uh, you really need to do something because it is a no-brainer today. We rebate these things, we give them away, we trade them in, we bring it into desert bulb. There are so many ways that you can get a CFL light bulb, and you immediately drop your cost for the same amount of light by 75 percent. Let's say your, your lighting bill is $100 a month, your lighting bill, and you're using incandescent bulbs. Take those out, screw in CFLs, and your $100 bill reduces to what? $25 a month, right? And then you can ramp that up depending on how many light bulbs you've got, how big your building is, and so forth. So it's really a no-brainer. What Kurt, Kurt, you'd have to have some brains to figure all of that out, but, but actually, the cost I'm effective... I'm not an engineer, but I, <laughs> but I learned a few basics, and that's really all it takes. But, but yeah, the cost effectiveness of changing your lights from today's technology is, is so great that you really, that one you got to do. That one you got to do first. And there are still, I got, I got a note from uh, Larry, uh, who's, who works in our, he's our operations director uh, at Energy. Hawaii Energy. He uh, sent a note. He was uh, visiting uh, Lahaina uh, last week, and he said, uh, "You know, incandescent bulbs are alive and well in, in Lahaina." So at least he was there. He saw it. We're going to make sure we go back and visit and and take care of that because it is a real, real waste. And they pay more than thirty five cents. I mean, anybody from Lahaina or anybody from now? It's it's hot. It's really hot. Uh, then the, the next easy hit, cheap hit, in fact, you can make money with this. Retrofit old equipment. 
first thing you do, you got an old refrigerator, it's older than 10 years, you don't even have to do the calculation. That is a money saver because the technology has improved so much in just the last 10 years. Replace that refrigerator, don't leave it out in your garage. In fact, we're so interested in you not leaving an old refrigerator plugged in just to cool a six pack that we will give you a rebate. If you, we will actually come out, pick up, and recycle properly <coughs> any of the islands, your old refrigerator, and give you a rebate to boot. It's a little different on each island, but <coughs> you a rebate. And when you go to pick up a new refrigerator, a new high efficiency energy star refrigerator, we'll give you another rebate because it is so cost effective. And one of the reasons it's cost effective is because anytime you have an appliance or a light or anything that runs kind of constantly, it's using electricity constantly, it doesn't have to use a whole lot. It uses it uh, every hour of the year. Uh, it, it mounts up. So, timers. Think about this. Would you come home, drive your car home, park it in the driveway, uh, go in, eat dinner, and leave the motor running. Just leave the car running, right? Brush your teeth, go to bed, get up the next morning, take a shower, and go back out and get in your running car and drive it to work, park it, leave it running. We do that with a lot of appliances in the house, and some of them use a lot more power than you think. I mean, you're asleep and nobody's watching that cable TV. And so what we suggest is just take a simple timer and put it on there. And this would be buy it to Kmart for less than 10 bucks. You plug your cable box in. And by, by the way, cable boxes are notorious for being uh, very inefficient, especially when they're off. You expect that they would ramp down considerably, but some of them really use a lot. So, uh, power. So put the timer on there, tell it to, to cut off at 11 o'clock, and you know, if you want to watch TV the next morning, or you go to work, tell it to come back on at 6 o'clock, and then you can watch TV, and you won't have to wait. That's the thing. People don't want to wait for your cable box to warm up. And if you get up at 2 in the morning and want to watch TV, it's going to take three or four or five minutes for it to reboot, right? But the point is that all of that time when you're not using it, it, it could be off, not using any power. Uh, and then behavior change. Uh, how many of you have seen one of these uh, home energy reports? Uh, we have uh, quite a few people on, on all of the islands now that are getting these reports. And they basically compare your usage with your neighbors of a similar uh, type of uh, residence. And, uh, and sometimes you get, you look at the, here I am, here, here's my neighbor, you know, here's the very best uh, uh, user of, of power in my neighborhood. And so you can see where you, where you, uh, uh, can, where you are in the grand scheme of things. So you can do something about it or you can uh, pin a star on your chest and say, well, I'm the best in my neighborhood. Um, so these are easy hits cheap hits, and, and they're very effective, and we do quite a bit of them. Uh, the success stories, uh, condo sub-metering, I don't know how many of you are familiar, but there's some large condos that have one meter, and they pay per square foot for electricity. Well, what we found is that as soon as you put a sub-meter in and measure everybody's individual usage, and then charge them accordingly, suddenly the total so what power is used by that building goes down by maybe 20%. We're thinking that it might, in some buildings, go down as much as 30%. Uh, and, and so we're, we're doing a lot of this now, and, and it's, it's saving energy. And this is energy that was, it was only being used because people thought, well, you know, it's, I'm not having to really pay for this. I'm sharing it with, so I'll use a lot more than my fair share and make sure that somebody else is picking up the tab. And, if everybody's doing that, the power bill, the total uh, uh, consumption is way up. Exhaust fan monitors. Uh, here in, uh, in uh, 
Honolulu. There are a lot of basements with uh, parking garages. They have huge exhaust fans. Uh, you hear them rumbling sometimes, but the interesting thing is when they were installed, they overbuilt. They put in great big uh, fans, and and they basically just turned them on and left them on. They didn't want anybody to die of carbon monoxide poisoning. And guess what? Um, when we we had a vendor come by and say, hey, I've got this little box, you know, and we have everybody coming by some kind of giving us a story about how this little black box would save a lot of money. Well, we look at all of them. Some of them are really kooky, but these guys <laughs> seem to have, uh, you know, something going. And so we put some in and found out that in some places, we could reduce what was a 24-hour fan run. People were leaving them on 24-7. And if you then just measure when it needs to come on and tell it to go off when the parts per million are, are below the, or at a safe level, we found fans that had run 24 hours a day that ran on average when we had the CO monitors and ran on average a total of 15 minutes a day, a 90% reduction. The rest was complete wasted to be happen. And, you know, we, we learn when somebody comes to town, you know, we always listen to them, no matter how kooky they sound or look, and, and this one really paid off. Uh, here's another one that we, we haven't gotten out there <coughs> Yet, but the water cooler timers, I didn't realize. We've got a water cooler in our office, and I thought, well, you know, not everybody has a water cooler, but they've got lots of water coolers in, in Honolulu, and they stay on all the time. And some of them give you hot and cold water, so they're, they're really going strong, and you're only there, what, eight, nine hours a day? The rest of the time, they keep it hot and cold, and there's nobody there. We calculated we're going to save lots of money, and this is just a simple timer that we'll put on there. And again, if, once you start looking, you find that there we still waste an enormous time. Yeah. And then behavior change, conservation, just turn the lights off in the last one we can run. What about next year? Uh, we have all of this uh, prescriptive incentives. These are the ones that we've done so much. We, you just go to our website and you, you look and see this is how much you get for this kind of incentive. So if you want to go buy this, we'll give you this, this rebate. Uh, custom incentives, these are the ones that basically if we don't have an incentive, you come to us and you tell us we've got some parameters, we'll build one for you that will encourage you to do more than you were otherwise willing to do in terms of installing something high efficiency or, or whatever it might be. So that we encourage people to come to us. Special programs, we've got the Small Business Direct Install Lighting, we've got going, and, uh, and that's where for Schedule G, which is the Terra, the Schedule G Small Businesses, uh, we could not get people to put in lighting. So we have taken a bigger chunk of what we all pay into this, and we've gone out and, and started uh, actually just coming in saying, this is so crazy for you to still have allergens and, and incandescent bulbs. We're going to change them out. It won't cost you anything. Just get out of the way, and our contractors will go in and do it. And that's been a real success. Uh, it's costing us a little bit more. We have to do a little bit more of the really cost-effective things in order to balance out when we actually give the whole thing away. But that's that's working. I was asked to talk a little bit about uh, this next one, on bill financing. Uh, that is coming. Uh, there are two bills, or there are two uh, mechanisms that are in play right now. One still in the legislature, this green bill financing. Uh, it's just another way to pull money in to allow us to finance energy conservation efficiency measures, 100% uh, financing for you, and they're going to add uh, renewables. So we, we and, and there are two, one's in the legislature right now, we don't know exactly what's going to come out eventually on that, but the other is a PUC um, uh, directed program that the public benefits uh, fee 
administrator, that's us, that's Hawaii Energy, will administer. So we're going to be administering, we'll set the program up, the target date is we'll be ready to roll by the, the 2nd of January. So we're we're really rushing hard. That's the main reason why I haven't been at the rest of the conferences. This week was a big push on that. So uh, myself and others have been really working hard on that. So, uh, more behavior change. Their behavior, we just started scratching the surface. We've got to figure out a way to get people to take that personal uh, responsibility that I talked about for energy uh, savings. Okay, why should you care? All of these reasons that we, I'm, I'm sure you've talked about, you've thought about climate instability, sea level rise, food and water insecurity for us here in Hawaii, imported fuel volatility, and you know, it's the future of Hawaii that we're talking about, the planet and, and ultimately us. And for those of you who think we could wait a while, anybody know where that's at? Yeah, High Low Beach. Remember about 10 years ago, every year, Mr. Beach was great, all the world-class beaches. They still do. I was so proud. Well, yeah, they still do, but we're no, no longer one, two, or three. For year after year, I was so proud. I'd say, send, send stuff back to North Carolina, the picture of Dr. Beach there, High Low Beach, number one. And it slipped to number two, number three, and now it's off the chart. This is happening now. It's not something that our children are going to have to worry about. It's, I can't go to the beach without falling off the, the cliff there. And so, you know, that's why we should do it. I'm not going to go through this because I was supposed to wrap up at the end, and I, I'm not the end. So, uh, top five things you can do do your lighting. You personally, do your lighting. Install solar water heating. I haven't talked about that. Uh, and Energy Star appliances, that's the number two thing you can do. Uh, install and maintain high efficiency cooling if you have to have cooling uh, where needed. Don't waste energy, change your behavior, turn the lights on, and then get personally involved in the clean energy sustainability effort. I'm going to close now. I'm going to do it so thank you very much. Sorry for you. Number one, I'm going last. <laughs> Number two, I, I, it's like kindergarten. I want my little blanket, my portable, my little thing of milk, and go take a nap. It's uh, that spaghetti really stuck with me. Put it up here. This is going to be more of a high level. We're going to talk about a project that's actually been done and at a high level. I'm not going to go into some of the great detail we've heard on some of the lighting and things we've done, you know, but uh, this will be a, a good example. How many of here are associated with UH Community Colleges at all? Raise your hand. Okay, you should be very proud. You've got some great administrators that have uh, been very forward thinking. I, I've provided projects across the country and uh, really Hawaii is a leader and I'll show you why here in just a, a minute. Uh, we we, we uh, uh, participated, and we're luckily fortunate enough to be uh, selected to do a performance contract for the University of Hawaii Community Colleges. Uh, Ray's team was a big part of that. He talked about the incentives. It helps them do more than what they'd normally be able to do. And, uh, so it's uh, uh, it's really a team effort, you know, everybody working together to do this. Very quickly, I'm gonna, I'm, I know everybody's, we need to keep going, so I'm going to fly through these pretty quick. and. Uh, Leave some questions and answers at the very end. But, um, <coughs> let's see, so that finger there. Um, we'll talk about some Hawaii projects and specifically uh, what we've got going, what we're, we're developing, uh, some of the savings, and uh, some of the Hawaii team here for Johns Controls. Uh, six years ago, when I started coming out here, there was uh, me. That's it. Okay, there was no team local here in, in Johns Controls. Uh, now we've got like five or six full-time people here, staff. Uh, working the projects we have got going. Uh, John's Controls, um, one thing about performance contracting, if, you don't, if you're not familiar with it, I'll just tell you really quick what it is. 
Johnson Controls goes into facilities like a school and we look at their existing infrastructure, mechanical, electrical, building envelope. We look for ways of making it more efficient, everything we've just been talking about here for the last hour. Okay? We guarantee the savings that those, those efficiencies are going to pay for, and then they end up paying for the project. And by state statute, every year, the savings have to exceed what the cost is for the project for financing. All right, So it's a great way to get things uh, done. Those guarantees right now, we have over $7.5 billion in guarantees out there worldwide. And we're guaranteeing that these projects. So it's really a way to take the risk off of the project owners and shifting it back to Johnson Controls. And we're, we're so efficient at doing so much, we know exactly what we're doing. And we do short, we do write a shortfall check once in a while. It happens. Okay, mistakes are made, engineering calculations, behavior, other things happen. But uh, bottom line is uh, we are the world leader in performance contracting uh, In Hawaii, we've been operating here for over 50 years. <coughs> Johnson Controls is not new to Hawaii. Most of our competitors have showed up in the last 10 years. We've been here for a long, long, long time. Uh, we have over 100 plus employees, and uh, Hawaii is really our, our, our uh, gateway to the, the whole Pacific, Guam and, and Pacific Islands. This is, everything's going to be loaded, located here, the jobs and everything here in Hawaii, and then we'll, we'll send them out to the different locations mm -hmm. to provide the, uh, develop those projects worldwide. Um, I'm going to go through here really, really quick. Uh, again, uh, Ted Peck is back. He's our new general manager here in Hawaii that uh, we brought on about four or five months ago to lead the team. Um, Lisa, right here, she's our engineering manager uh, here in Hawaii. Joe Caldwell, he's not only our project manager, he is going to be the energy manager for UHCC. So if you're in a community college, and uh, he'll be not only doing the measurement verification for you, making sure the savings are there, he's going to be out working with the sustainability committees at each of the campuses, making sure that we're, we're, we're doing all these great things we're talking about, making our campuses as green, the behavior, all those things that we've uh, talked about. Judy, she's going to come up here in a minute and talk about the education program. We'll go into much greater detail there. So our past projects. Um, these are the projects that are probably 10 or 12 years old that have happened here in, in Hawaii. A lot of federal, uh, city and county, um, and of course some uh, university projects. Right now, um, we are just completing a $33 million project for the community colleges, which is, are the four Oahu campuses. That, uh, not this one, but the other four campuses here on Oahu. Uh, those are finishing construction going to the measurement and verification phase. Now we call it, excuse me, the next one is the uh, renewable. Ray, you said do the smart things first, reduce the kilowatts you're actually using, then go back and do the renewable. That's exactly what we're doing. Think about this now. But each campus, we're saving between 20 to 23 percent of the energy they were using before we did the project. Okay, those are kilowatt hours taken off the table that have nothing to do with escalation in the future. They're gone. History, us to the vista. Okay, on top of that, we're in the in the process of installing some PV, which will generate another basically 20 percent of their energy. Now, talk about managing your your energy and your infrastructure. That's, that is, it's awesome what the college has been doing. Uh, Maui College, again, it's completing construction, and we're also moving into the construction phase of the renewable. We'll go into more of that in detail here in a minute. Another project that Johnson Controls was fortunate enough to win is the Department of Transportation project. That's all the airports, all the highways, all the harbors, statewide, all islands. Huge project. The savings on that, and we're still finishing the investment grade audit, we're going to be between 16 to 18 million dollars a year. That's a lot of kilowatt hours. And again, most of that's going to be taken right off the, to the table. Good, good stuff. I might add, Hawaii, I think there's a slide here. I might get to it. Hawaii leads the country in dollars spent on doing performance contracting than any other state in the country. A lot of it's because of those high interest rates, or uh, utility rates you're talking about, 32 cents here, maybe 40 cents on some of the neighboring islands. But good, good for you. You're, you're, you're doing a great job. Now, when we came to be a part that incorporated all of that, and why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you reduce the energy costs? Why wouldn't you use renewable? Why would you not do all this great construction and not make the education a part of it? We talk about behavior. Behavior comes from education. But Judy will talk more about that. And then what about the ongoing for the next 20 years, 
program and energy manager are supporting all those efforts, making sure the savings are coming in and promoting energy conservation and, and staying on top of all the technologies that are out there and bringing them to the, the university system so they can employ those as they go. Nowhere in the country is that being done like it is here. Okay, I'm not going to go through a lot of these <coughs> things. These are standard, what we call FIMS, Facility Improvement Measures, uh, that were part of the project. I'll just share that uh, a couple of these, retro commissioning or continuous commissioning. When you buy a car, do you ever take it up for a tune-up somewhere along the line? Sure you do. When you have a building, do you just operate it and it just operates the way you day one like it does 10, 15 years ago, uh, from then? No. It starts falling out. Things start happening. You start wasting energy. And what we do, we're so stupid, what we do is we wait 15 or 20 years before we go back and do what we call retro commissioning. Why wait 15 or 20 years? Let's do retro commissioning. Let's be on top of it. So as things start falling out of parameters, we bring them back in now. Very inexpensive things to do, as Ray was talking about. Retro continuous commissioning is just a matter of calibrating or bringing things back in. Um, that's one of the great things we're going to be doing. We did uh, some big central plant uh, projects at Maui College, and the central plant was completely taken offline. Brand new central plant. Now, in addition to that, what, what is so outstanding is they had four air-cooled chillers that served different parts of the buildings out there at Maui College. Now, everybody that lives here in Hawaii, it's a beautiful state, love the sun, <coughs> but it's extremely corrosive. I've been to BYU. It's, 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 it attacks. You put the finest stainless steel out there you can, and it still attacks it. Okay. Chillers should last uh, with ASHRAE probably 10 to 15 years, easy. Right, Air-cooled chiller in Hawaii lasts about five, six years because of the corrosive environment. In this project, we took all those buildings off those air-cooled chillers. They were replacing them every five or six years for about $400,000 each time they changed them out. They're gone. They will never have to replace another air-cooled chiller at Maui College. And we updated the central plant, so everything is now fed to that central plant out to the, uh, the different buildings. And uh, talk about, you know, if you read the papers, when they talk about deferred maintenance, this is, this is gone. It's off the table. It's like those kilowatt hours I was telling you about. They're removed. They're gone. They'll never have to be replaced again. Um, kitchen exhaust fans, that's kind of a neat one. They, they, they ramp up and down based upon what you're actually doing. You ever walk in a kitchen and the fans are on in these uh, kitchens and they're on all the time? It's kind of like some of the thing, other things we were talking about today. Well, when they're not uh, having any smoke or anything's coming through, they ramp down. And they use uh, a lot less energy than what they want to use. Uh, vending machines, talk about a no-brainer. Vending machines are made for one thing. Stock, stocking a lot of Coke or Pepsi and costing a lot of money to operate because you think Pepsi or Coke can give a rat's rear about how much energy you're spending to cool their products? Not one little bit, okay? Bedding Myers are very inexpensive to replace, probably a year payback, two years. Um, and then probably the last thing I'll talk about is the, the building kiosks. We put building kiosks throughout the, the campuses, again, from an educational standpoint. And it's kind of cool because the number of kilowatt hours you save, information will come up like how many hamburgers I would buy how many, you know, the things that you relate to, okay, that we, every day to day in our lives. So that's, that's, that's really cool. I talked about the, uh, the, the we, we finished the, we're finishing the performance contract, now we're putting the, the PV in. Um, it's difficult, it's not easy here in Hawaii to do this always, especially on college campuses. It's been uh, between the legislature, between the IRS studies, all this stuff you gotta do. It, it's been a little bit challenging to do, but, as you can see, we're going to put uh, about 1.6 uh, megawatts between the different campuses uh, throughout, which is going to take another 20% of the consumption. It's actually now being generated through the sun. So a neat idea. Here's an ad that's actually going to be running here locally uh, in Hawaii um, and actually nationally. Um, over the next uh, 20 years, we're going to help the community colleges save over $80 million. That's a big, big um, it talks about some of the, the measures that we've, we've done. But it's also going to, from a sustainability standpoint, or the 
picture you showed us with the beach and the erosion and the sea levels rising. 5,200 metric tons of uh, carbon emissions reduced by the project. Um, here's just some of the, the numbers of the, that we know for that. Uh, Judy, why don't I turn over here to talk about education here for a minute. My name is Judy Mouton. I'm the program director for Johnson Controls uh, for North America. And it has been such a pleasure to come here and to have an opportunity to speak with you all. Part of our, and as Scott said, you know, customers sometimes don't take the full program. But I know I see some familiar faces back here. They don't know that, uh, that know that for the last 19 years, Jobs Controls has provided energy education from K-12 to higher ed. And this is the only institution that really took the entire program and didn't say, I just want one aspect of your program. So twice a year, we do have workforce development seminars and educational seminars for the community and for the students on the island. And as a matter of fact, on Tuesday, Hawaii Energy participated in our program as they did previously last year. So we have local partners that are participating, that give it to students in the community for free. And the four programs we have as far as how to install solar thermal, uh, photovoltaic, lead, energy auditing, was just completed on Tuesday. Another thing we have is the UHCC and JCI Fellows. Those are like leaders in the local campus that really learn about sustainability education and they share that awareness with their peers. And so I have a little video clip that I'd like to show uh, at the end of it. And the video clip also talks about the uh, uh, Live Simple campaign, giving up three things on your uh, campus and for yourself in order to be more sustainable. As part of this too, we have designed five curriculum uh, and the modules so that, you know, a teacher could say, you know, as part of a reading assignment or a writing assignment, I want my student to learn about solar panels. So we're going to be doing that continuously over the next, uh, I think, uh, three years. So I'm going to show you this video for some of the fantastic students that have worked with our coordinator here, Shana Trivena. And I tell you, you're going to be so impressed by them. They are inspirational and in what they're doing on their campus and what they're doing in their lives. What the governor's doing? Yeah. Is that the last two slides? I was going to have He's going to, he's got that. Okay, okay, okay. No problem. Sorry, do you have two slides? Let's just do two. Technology. One thing while we're, we're doing this, again, I, I got to give kudos to the, the administration, the leaders, uh, the faculty, the students, because they all played a role in the program that we did with UHCC. They all did. And, and, and one of the things I want to give kudos to is the fact that the administration that's over buildings and maintenance, okay, that, that's really on, on pace for the energy bills each month, um, never before in any college I've ever worked with have they ever taken those savings dollars and allocated them for anything except their buildings and their facilities and their administration. And uh, John Morton, Michael Nibasami, Brian Kashoida, they all got together and said, you know what, we're going to take some of these savings and we're going to use it to fund educational programs that Judy's talking about. Okay? It isn't done anywhere else. Talk about you know, leadership and, and wanting to make sure that, again, this is not a project that's just put in, done, and you walk away. It's one that's going to be maintained and, and sustained over a long period of time. I just want to talk about the last two bullet points. Uh, before the staff goes on. So we're designing now energy efficiency technology certificates uh, as part of the grant that the university has, as well as part of our program is to have adjunct faculty members that are challenge control employees that come to your university to speak and to really educate your students. And we've done a lot on uh, Maui College. So those subject matter experts are available too. And you'll see, uh, we're on sustainable UH, you know, when we're having these programs 
then you're all free of charge. Did you put you on the spot? The grant that we participated in to help them get, how much was it? It's 24 million. 24 million dollars. So, I mean, that's a partnership. That's working together. Okay? And all of these modules, everything is part of, part of that grant. We're all, that's going to be all on the website. So we can have self-paced classes that you can sign into and uh, you know, educate yourself. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm done here in three slides. Okay, first, uh, you know, we're here to, uh, to help support the Hawaii Clean Energy Initiative. And that's the 7% reduction of oil that's the value of oil. And that's what everything we, everybody's talked today. That's, that's all going towards that, that, that goal. Uh, this was the day I was talking about. Uh, right now, in 2010, and it was actually even higher in 2011, I believe, Ted, uh, the state of Hawaii spent seventy-seven dollars and seventy-six cents per capita to go towards energy programs. That's there's Hawaii, and then there's second place down here, and the rest of them. Okay, Hawaii truly is a leader in, in, in this city. Uh, the governor's new plan again. The economy is so susceptible to the spike in oil prices. In UHCC, what happens is when oil prices go up. They have to still pay the utilities. Where's the money come from? Your education programs. Takes it right out. They have to pay the bills. So all the all the things we talked about are all going to help support that. And again, just uh, in summary, I'm going to wrap up here. So, you know, uh, Johnson Controls is extremely committed to Hawaii. Uh, the programs that are going on, the projects we're working on now, the future projects that we'll be working on in the future. Um, everybody plays a role in this, and we're just very uh, pleased and happy to be a partner with Hawaii. So,